Hello, USA Swimming World. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Alicia Glass. I'm a USOC sport dietitian, and I have Cody Miller here with me today, one of our national team athletes, and we're going to cook up a taco skillet. And the idea behind cooking this today is that um, we're going to go through some basic cooking skills. We're going to talk about some fun nutrition facts and trivia. And then also, too, we're going to talk um, to Cody about how he fits um, performance cooking into his busy week. And it's not just busy, it's tiring. He trains a lot. And so we'll talk about how he gets some of the convenience worked into his week um, as, as it pertains to fueling and making sure he's getting what he needs in terms of calories. So um, the way we're going to kind of work through today is that um, we're going to kind of work through the recipe. And then when there's time to work, work, uh, talk through some questions, um, we're going to interview Cody a little bit, put him in the hot seat. Um, we're going we're gonna to take the time to do that when there's some downtime in, in the cooking. So um, we're going to get started. So like I said, we're going to uh, cook up a ground turkey taco skillet. We're going to use quinoa today. Um, Cody, I think, chose to do rice, and that really is kind of your option. You can choose what type of meat you want to put into this. You can put whatever type of grain that you want to put into this. So Cody, to get, to get started, I wanted to ask you the question, how do you work cooking and meal prep into your busy week of training? I try to th think, hey, great intro, by the way. You're like a professional. It's like you do this all the time. Right. Um, I try to minimize the amount of cooking that I have to do on a weekly basis. I'm not going to lie to you. My wife does most of the cooking. I like cook a little bit, but I, I, you know, I'm not the best. But oftentimes we will cook three or four or five meals at a time just to kind of stock up the fridge so that – you know, on days where I have like a morning swim, a lift, and then an afternoon swim, and I get home after like five hours of exercise, I just need to be able to like pop something something in the microwave and then eat it like 60 seconds later. And so I'm like all about maximum convenience. And I've never made this meal before. We've had similar meals. Like we, we do a fair amount of uh, a fair amount of bowls, you know, like different kinds of Mexican rice bowls. Um, but the nice thing about this is if you can cook it pretty quickly, and um, it's definitely going to serve way more than just one meal. Like I'll definitely have leftovers for like three or four meals, which is good because even on quarantine, I don't want to do a lot of cooking. So. Yep, I hear you. And you know what? I think Cody, you made a really good point. Trying to figure out what your level of convenience that you need um, to make uh, proper nutrition come together. Um, just because I acknowledge swimmers and most athletes aren't wanting to spend a lot of time in the kitchen. Um, some do. Some like to do it. I, I kind of compare it to scrapbooking. Some people like to do scrapbooking. Other people think, why would you spend time on that? But it can be cathartic, it can be relaxing, it can be enjoyable for some, but then for others, it's a chore. So I totally acknowledge that. And, um, you know, if you're not the one actually making it, figuring out who it is that's going to help you um, and then working with them to make sure they understand what your nutrition needs are. Um, so while Cody's talking, I'm kind of working on cutting some things up. Um, uh, I, I do want to quickly run you through how to cut up a pepper, and I think you can kind of see what I'm doing if I cut it over here. Um, anything that's round, the first thing you want to do is make it so that it's not, there's not a round side that you're trying to balance on when you're cutting, especially if you're using a sharp knife. Um, sharp knives actually are not as dangerous as dull knives, because dull knives you can cut yourself. So um, what I'm doing is I cut the top and the bottom off. And then I'm going to open up the side so it's no longer round. And I'm cutting out the inside. And then I'm cutting all the seeds, which kind of come out all together. I'm cutting those off. Okay. And then it's just a little bit easier to go through and cut your slices. And then anything that you're making that's kind of like a chili or a soup or something that you're throwing a bunch of different ingredients in together, you want to try to cut them up into even or equal sized pieces just so that everything's cooking at the same rate. And Cody's the pro over there. He's already done all of his prep. I'm prepared. I diced mine a little bit smaller than yours, but you know, everybody yeah. likes them a little bit different. Definitely a preference. Um, if you like big, hearty chunks, um, a lot of times when I'm talking to parents, my recommendation is to cut things up a little bit smaller so that if you have a picky eater, they can't really identify things as easy. So um, I'm going to add these uh, peppers together. So I think we're going to post the recipe so that you guys can have access to it. You'll notice that, like I said, you're going to kind of choose your own adventure in this um, particular recipe. So the recipe calls for green peppers. Both Cody and I decided, you know what? We don't like the taste of green peppers as much as we like the taste of red peppers and orange peppers and yellow peppers. 
So he and I both chose um, the color that we like. Um, there is a little bit more vitamin C in a red pepper. Um, most peppers all start out green, and then the longer they're on the vine, they turn into the other colors. Wait, are you serious? Like red and orange peppers start green and change yeah. colors? And you can kind of taste it. They're, they're like, oh, my mind. yeah, so a um, little trivia for you. Um, the last thing I'm going to cut up, and I'm going to ask you one more question while I'm cutting up this onion. Um, a little bit of idea of you know how your nutrition has changed let's just say from when you were a high school swimmer uh -oh. to now yeah i mean like radically changed my diet from 10 years ago is so different just because we just know more you know like in high school um my mom started to make a shift to start having us eat more fruits and vegetables and less processed food you know but when i was in college i really struggled because i was eating a lot of dorm food you know eating a lot of processed food and um Really, when I turned pro after I graduated college, which was, geez, over six years ago now, I'm like really getting old. Um, but I was like, okay, I need to do everything I can to try to make this pro swimming thing work. And so one thing that I really focused on was my diet. And um, I started making a heavy emphasis on cutting out extra sugar and just kind of junk food in general. So I completely stopped drinking sodas and stop eating candies and cut back on ice cream not that i like ate a lot of those things out in general but just so that the, to have that peace of mind i like really cut back and then i really started hammering home like eating a lot of fruits and vegetables so like right now my fridge is packed with different fruits and vegetables and and really i think like the biggest thing is like my snack foods right instead of snacking on a bag of potato chips i'd snack on like actually right before we started the zoom i was snacking on uh, little carrot chips and hummus so like making little habits like that of avoiding, you know, really bad processed high sugary foods and, and kind of replacing that with, with more lean meats and, and fruits and vegetables. And honestly, after college, when I made that transition, I think that that was one of the biggest things that helped propel me towards, you know, like making nationals and then ultimately making the Olympics was like really focusing on diet. So, I mean, I'm not the biggest chef in the world. I don't, I'm not the most knowledgeable about food, but you know, another thing I'm weird, like I'll eat salads for breakfast on like light days. If I have like a light, light morning, like I'll have a salad with like chicken for breakfast. People think that that's wild and weird, but I just, I feel better after I eat that. And I know it, it's not bad for me. So, you know, be longer too. I mean, I, I think that is definitely one of the things that, uh, I, I try to educate athletes on a lot is that, um, especially for breakfast, people think breakfast should be a sweet, a sweet meal or no. a sweet like cereals and waffles and pancakes and fruity things, um, but introducing savory types of meals too. And exactly as you said, I mean, if you know that you need to get certain nutrients in like carbohydrates and proteins, um, especially if you're doing it before practice, you need energy, you need yeah. protein to reinforce the muscle, you know what your body needs. Yeah. You know what, if you're up for chicken and whatever, great, I love it. And you know what else I've noticed during this whole like quarantine lockdown thing is when I have sugar in the mornings, I feel like my cravings are worse later in the day. I don't know if there's any coral. I don't know the science, but you're the expert, not me. But on mornings when I eat like some turkey bacon and some leafy greens and a few vegetables, I find that like by 6 p.m. when I'm like done with my day laying around, I'm not like, I'm not all of a sudden craving, you know, sugar or carbs. I, I don't know if that's, that's why, but Sometimes I feel like if I start my day either eating those sugary things, then it just it like progresses, it like snowballs. Yeah, and uh, there's there's definitely a, like a, a personal side to what sits best with one person isn't always the answer for someone else. Um, also, too, if athletes are training super hard in the morning, they're doing like a really heavy workout first thing in the morning, recommendations for what they should be eating first thing might be different than what we make for someone who's going straight to work and sitting at a desk all day. Um, so, you know, there, there are changes in hormone levels that go into, you know, both workouts and, you know, just lifestyle things that can really change your cravings. Um, so there are certain hormones and certain things that happen that are secreted. Uh, in your brain that have you craving certain things versus other things. So there's, it's highly individualized. There's a lot of, um, you know, science that, that has gone into, you know, why do people crave certain things? Um, I like kind of the old school recommendation of if you're craving something, your body's trying to tell you something. And so a lot of times if you're craving salty things, you can kind of reflect on, have I sweat a lot in the last couple of hours? Do I need to replace sodium? That's just one example. Um, and, you know, there are a bunch of different um, examples like that, too, that um, kind of come up. But 
we're going to keep working through this recipe and we're going to, we're going to talk in a little bit. So the first thing that we're going to do is we kind of prep our skillet. And one thing that I wanted to bring up, because you'll see in this recipe that they recommend either a cast iron skillet or a nonstick skillet. And I just wanted to talk about that real fast. First thing that I wanted to say is that, you know, if you've been cooking with a cast iron skillet, great. If you don't mind any of the tastes that come out of it, great. That will disregard anything that I say right now. But in general, cast iron skillets are great for high fat meat cooking or high fat recipes that help to kind of coat the inside of the iron skillet. What we're going to be making today is a higher acidic type of recipe. And in general, when you're making higher uh, acidic recipes, some of that acid can kind of leach the metal out of the cast iron skillet. And you might notice, and I don't want to ruin this for people who've been cooking in the cast iron skillet for this long, but it can kind of create more of a metallic taste in some of these higher acidic recipes. So we're actually gonna use, and I think Cody also has a nonstick skillet. Um, we're gonna be using nonstick skillets that um, if treated well and maintained well, there's really no harm in using a nonstick versus a cast iron skillet. Now I say if they're maintained well, that means that you're not using sharp forks, knives, things like that in them to scratch them up. Okay, so if you um, have nice pans at home, your mom might have told you, don't use anything sharp in there. Make sure you use a, you know, a silicone spatula or a plastic spatula or a wooden spatula when you're cooking in your um, nonstick pans. The other thing, and I, I cringe every time I see somebody do this, but you need to wait for your nonstick skillet to cool the entire way before you put it under cool water or you run water over it that's going to, um, it, can, it can cause it to warp and it can ruin that Teflon inside coating. Okay, so you need to make sure you take care of your nonstick skillets, okay? So, Cody, we're gonna get going here. We're gonna add a tablespoon of olive oil or avocado oil. The key here when using um, olive oil is you don't want the skillet to be too hot because olive oil has a lower smoke point than other oils. So um, I, I would say recomm my recommendation is to turn it on a medium, medium heat uh, on your oven. And then you're gonna add in the olive oil. And one of the recommendations I, I make for new, uh, new cooks in the kitchen is you can always turn the heat up, but if your skillet's way hot, it's kind of, it's hard to have the heat go down. Okay, so especially when you're not really as familiar with what heat it takes in your skillet to cook things. You can always turn the heat up, but it's hard to turn the heat down quickly, okay? So I'm just gonna, we're gonna coat the, um, the pan. And again, the other thing, having a lower um, uh, smoke point with this oil is uh, we also don't wanna burn the garlic, okay? So that's the next ingredient we're gonna add. We're gonna add some flavors into this pan. So we've got the olive oil, we're gonna add in some uh, garlic. And this calls for two cloves of garlic. Now what you're gonna see here is I'm using pre-cut garlic. There's a couple reasons for this. One, I'm busy. I like to have this as a backup item. Two, when you're going through a pandemic and you go to three different grocery stores and they're all sold out of garlic, you realize there's a garlic shortage maybe in the city that you live in. So that's why I'm gonna be using this um, pre-cut minced garlic that you can be stored in the fridge and it stays pretty good for a really long time. So that's what I'm gonna be using. Cody, I don't know, did you mince up your own garlic that you bought fresh? I just chopped it up fresh. I will say garlic is probably my favorite seasoning in the entire world. So anything with garlic and I'm in. Awesome, so we're gonna throw that into the pan. With that lower temperature, you don't want it to burn unless you like the taste of more roasted garlic. We're gonna let that heat up just a little bit. Then we're gonna throw in the half of the large onion that you have diced. Look at all that onion, so much onion. That's oh. a big thing right there. That's right, can't have too much. And that, that is another variation of this recipe that you can have is that, I mean, if you're, so, if you're someone that really likes a lot of certain types of vegetables or vegetables in general, you can really easily make modifications to the amounts of things that we have here. So um, if you love onion, do a whole onion. If you- Do it, go on video. Yeah, perfect. I love it. We're gonna let that brown up a little bit. Where these two ingredients are going to help with um, flavoring the meat that we're about to, 
to pull her in there. And I just wanted to talk really fast about this recipe calls for ground turkey. You can use this, you can use um, red meat if you, if you eat red meat. Um, you could do a brown tofu if you wanted. You could really just stick with beans. Um, that would take a little bit more kind of trial and error in terms of what types of beans and um, do you mash them first, do you keep them whole? Um, so that would take a little bit more trial. It's not a direct substitution, but we're using the ground turkey just because it's leaner. Um, if you're someone that likes to eat red meat, um, there's recent research showing that two to three servings or less of grass-fed red meat does not increase the risk for some of the colon cancers that have been associated with consumption of red meat. So for me, dietitian working with uh, elite athletes, if, if an athlete wants to eat red meat, great. It's a great source of iron. If an athlete doesn't want to eat red meat, whether it's just taste or idea of it, then it's not something that I actively recommend. Both of them, ground turkey and red meat, are great protein sources. So in general, um, most of your meals, you should have about the size of your palm serving of protein. Okay, so it's about the size of a deck of cards. Cody, what's your, what's your favorite kind of red meat or type of meat that you like to have? Well, I, I do a lot of turkey as well. Um, you know, we, we are like primarily, I guess, plant-based, but when we do red meat, we usually do like uh, ground bison. I'm a big fan of ground bison and we get locally sourced, you know, grass-fed bison here, which is awesome. Um, we do a little bit of ground beef, but very, I mean, very rarely. Usually it's, I mean, if I had to choose one, my favorite is ground bison. I think it just tastes better for whatever reason, you know, um, and we do a fair amount of turkey as well. Yeah, I think um, with ground turkey or ground chicken, you do have to do a lot of flavoring. Like yes. You to add a little bit more flavor to it. Um, red meat comes with a little bit more flavor. Some of the gamier meats, so bison has a little bit more flavor. So you just, there's a way to do it. You just kind of have to put a little bit more flavor to it. As far as meat goes, the most, like, meat I eat is probably chicken, like lean chickens. Um, that's probably, probably, you know, a lot of chicken breasts and stuff. I like that. I do think there is, it is important to consider the amount of saturated fat that's worked into the type of protein you're choosing. So whatever your choice is, that is something to keep an eye on. So even with ground turkey, there are some ground turkey that you can find in the grocery store that's pretty high in fat. So, uh, and, and it's saturated fat that we're kind of keeping an eye on. Um, plant sources of fats and unsaturated fats that you find, um, like an olive oil and fish even, those are definitely going to be better for your heart, better for fighting inflammation than um, the solid white fat that you see on a lot of uh, red meat or the marbling that you see. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're choosing your protein sources. So we're gonna let this brown up a little bit and um, we might, uh, we're gonna take on a couple questions while we let this brown up. Um, so the first question we have is, uh, Cody, what do you eat before an early morning, uh, early morning workout? Um, you know, early morning workouts, I usually try to eat light. I try to have something, but nothing, nothing that was really very heavy. So I like granola. Um, I'm a big fan of Cheerios. I know that's a little controversial, but the biggest thing is fruit. I really like peaches, apples, pears, maybe with like a little bit of peanut butter, um, but never, never a whole lot, right? Like before say a 5.30 AM swim, where we're going to swim 5.30 to 7.30, I might have one apple and a little bit of peanut butter and, you know, eight ounces of fluid before I hit the pool. And that's pretty much it. Um, and then I, I try to make sure I eat something immediately after practice too. So either a post-practice shake or you know, a, a good bar that's not super high in sugar, something like that. Um, but my biggest thing is I just don't like to eat a whole lot before a workout. I try to, you know, particularly early, early mornings, like I don't want to feel like there's something really heavy in my stomach when I'm trying to swim like four miles at 6 a.m. And this is a question that I have, Cody. Do you, do you have, it sounds like you have recovery snacks in your bag, but do you have like backup items that you're like, well, you know, I know I ate a good breakfast, but this set is pretty rough. And I, hey coach, I need to go grab something. Do you, do you yeah, have always, like I always have snacks in both my bag, like my gym bag that I take with me. Um, and then always in my locker at the pool. So whether it's power bars or, you know, those little, those little gummy energy things. Um, the, I think of what, what are the name of those, those little waffle, the stingers, the stinger waffles. I keep like an, uh, an emergency supply of those in my locker, just in case sometimes I'll get in for practice and I'll, I think that I've eaten enough. 
And then about 15, you know, 15, 20 minutes in the warm up before we start our main set, if I start to get a little hungry, I'm like, oh man, I'm going to, this is going to hurt. So I'll run into the locker room and grab one of those stinger bars or an apple or whatever I have. Um, even just those little peanut butter crackers, like those are great for like in, like right before practice, I'm talking minutes before practice because they're light and they're somewhat filling. So, oh yeah, there's, I, I never have a shortage of snacks. Yeah. And I, I would say that's one of the, the big things uh, for a lot of the athletes I work with is they know it's important to fuel, but then they also might, I mean, who knows what the coach has up his sleeve, right? In terms of what workout um, they have written. So always being prepared with a backup plan so that you're, you're ready to go if you need it. We're going to keep browning this. Cody, I don't know what yours is looking like. I still got, a, I don't know, another couple minutes anyway. Yeah, probably another minute or two and I'll throw the meat in. Oh, I already threw my meat in. I didn't tell you. Oh, no. I was trying to fry up my onions real good beforehand. Let's see. There you go. He's a pro. Oh, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, but I, I like my onions to be, you know, pretty crisp. So I'm going to throw it in. Uh, what kind of meal do you go for, Cody, before, the night before a big meet? Do you have a go-to? I don't have anything that I need to have. Like, it doesn't have to be something super specific. You know, I actually get this question a lot, and the, the thing that I always say is I never eat something that I wouldn't normally eat. So I wouldn't eat anything that's just, you know, I like try to stick to a routine. So I'm not going to go to a Japanese restaurant and get some crazy sushi the night before a race. I've done that before, and it didn't go very well. Trust me. So I just try to, you know, just stick with what, stick with what I know, whether that's like a chicken salad or, you know, uh, some salmon and some rice or, you know, a pasta with a, a tomato sauce, whatever it is. I mean, people always ask about carbo loading. I'm like, I mean, yeah, to a, to a degree, but just try to keep things normal. That's it. Just like stick to what you know. And as you know, because you've gone to so many international meets with us, sometimes when we're at world championships or the Olympics, like that's hard. It's, it's not always easy. Yeah. Yeah. My oh, yeah. Throw your meat in. Um, one of the things that I learned early on working um, with <laughs> – is that uh, the only true application of, of carbo loading in the exercise science sense is with our open water swimmers. Our open water swimmers, um, they burn through at least two hours worth of high intensity energy. And that's the true application of carbo loading. So if you wanna get, pe or, uh, if you wanna get spaghetti the night before a big beat and that's your go-to, that's totally fine. But you don't need to be cramming in a whole bunch of carbs the night before because you're not going to be burning through a whole bunch of, of energy, which according to the textbooks, exercise science textbooks, is at least two hours of all-out high-intensity activity. So open water swimmers, yes, pound some pasta. Um, but as Cody said, find a meal that works for you and that's familiar and um, is going to allow you to get a good night's sleep. All right, so um, I'm going to keep browning up my meat here. Cody, I think you're, you're going to be pretty soon coming up here. One thing I did want to talk about real fast is you might have noticed that uh, while Cody was talking, I opened up my can of black beans and I rinsed them. Um, and that's kind of a little, a little tip that um, if you rinse the beans that come out of a can or after you soak your beans and you rinse them after you soak them, uh, it can rinse off some of the uh, ingredients that are naturally found in beans that come out when you soak them. It can rinse off some of the, the ingredients that can cause some of the gas you might get after eating beans. Okay, so I always like to rinse my beans. You'll see in a lot of recipes it says canned beans rinsed. Um, so we're kind of on to that. You kind of want to get some of that taste off as well. Okay, so while, while we're still waiting for this mean to brown up, Cody, what is your favorite recipe to make? Well, before I tell you that, I was going to say, speaking of carbo loading and open water, so my roommate at the Olympics was Jordan Wilanowski, and I remember, you know, we roomed together for close to eight weeks, and like the six weeks before the Olympics, he was, I mean, he's got to swim at 10K, he's, the dude's racing at 10K, so he's got to eat, I mean, we as swimmers like eat a lot. But I remember going to dinner with him and then going back to the room and it's like, we would just have just finished a dinner as a team after an afternoon workout. And then like 45 minutes later, we get back to the room and he was already snacking on stuff. And I, and I just remember like, that's like real carbo loading. Like, 
I'm a dude that races 100 meters, sometimes 200 meters. So I think you're right. Like, I don't think we have to go crazy. Like, you know, from a training standpoint, we certainly need to eat more than probably most other athletes in other sports because we're such a high aerobic, you know, style of sport. But open water, those guys, I just, I'll never forget, like, I thought that I ate a lot. And then after living with, like, a true open water swimmer, I realized what, what that really was. I was, like, kind of blown away. So, how, did, how did that work? Did he do the 1500 and then the open water or open water and then the 1500 at the Olympics? It was the 1500 and then the open water race. Okay. So, so yeah. he had to recover, pound a bunch of carbs, recover, and then, yeah. So, exactly, yeah. So he, so the 1500 was earlier on, and then the 10K open water race was after all the, the pool events had finished. So, and no, he's, I mean, that dude's so so versatile because even a 1500 to a, to a 10K, like those are two totally different worlds. So, yeah, he had to, he had to seriously load up on whatever he could get his hands on in that, that Rio dining hall. <laughs> But I, I think it's important to kind of to, to explain that, yes, you got the Jordan Wolomovskis, but then you have some of the guys that are there just to swim the 50. Which yeah, yeah there's, there's layers, right? So, like, if there's a scale, look at me holding this spatula. So, if there's a scale, like, you've got Jordan on one end who is, like, swimming a 10K, and then, like, I'm in the middle swimming 100 and a 200 meter, and then you've got a guy like, you know, Anthony Urban who's pretty much just doing the 50. So, he's going to eat, like, way less. How's that meat looking, Cody? It's coming along. Maybe another couple minutes. Ah, probably not even that much more. It's looking good. Hey, Puff, don't bark. I'm trying to do a Zoom call. <laughs> All right, well, you know what, Cody? While you're in there, you can get, uh, put a little salt and pepper just to flavor up that meat. Yep, it's time. Let's do it. Hang on. Again, not the, uh, I'm seeding this up right now. Some people like a lot of the pepper. Some people not so much. You know who likes a, a lot of pepper? My wife. She's crazy. She, her father destroyed her taste buds growing up. And so she'll put little chili flecker, chili flakes in all kinds of stuff. And it like, it kills me sometimes. She doesn't even notice it. But, it, you know, what, what do I get? You know, that's, that's what I deserve. They teach their own. Boom. Season. All right, so I'm gonna measure out. So I know Cody already has his his rice that he's gonna add. He's got already got that measured out. I'm going to I'm gonna use quinoa. This calls for two thirds of a cup of quinoa. Cody's got a cup of his rice, and so yeah, this is a good opportunity to kind of talk about the different grain that you might add to this. Um, all grains are prepared in the same way. You have a dry grain that you're starting with, you're gonna add a certain amount of water and then you're gonna boil it for so, for so long to prepare it. And so you could start with brown rice, which takes about an hour to make. Same thing, you get you know, a certain amount of rice. Typically it's a, a, a two to one ratio, two cups of water to uh, one cup of dry grain, but there's some variation there. Um, I know with quinoa, quinoa takes more water to the amount of grain that you're, you're using. So my recommendation is whatever you're choosing, just check what the package says in terms of how much liquid you should be adding to the grain. So um, I'm going to be using two thirds of a cup of, of quinoa, and then we're going to add in, uh, I think it is, yeah, a cup and a half of broth. Okay, so that's another talking point I want to um, kind of cover really fast. I personally like to have, where did I put that? Oh, here. I like to use um, bouillon, okay? And so this is a jar of the paste that you can buy that this stays long, or stay, stays good a lot longer than having an open container of broth. Because here's my deal. You open up broth, you use what you need, and then you have an open container of broth that sits in your fridge. If you have a dog, you could pour the broth on their food and you can use it before it goes bad. But otherwise, you're stuck with an open container of broth that you just have to think about using. So I like these bouillon paste because all you do is you use, like I think it's like a teaspoon per cup. And then this, you put the lid back on and this is good, this is good until April 2022. So it, it just stays um, good a lot longer. The other option, and I'm not as much of a fan as this, of this, but um, they're vegetable bouillon cubes. So this is kind of like a dried out version. So what would you do with this? One cube, which is about a teaspoon, you drop that into a cup of boiling water and then that makes one cup of broth. So if you're someone that travels a lot, 
or you're someone that doesn't use that much broth and so you don't want an open container, um, these bouillon cubes or the paste is a good backup. Um, for today's purpose, I did get some chicken broth on hand. Make sure you shake it up before you pour it in, especially if it's been sitting on the grocery shelf for a while. Um, but this is gonna call for one and a half cups of broth. So Cody, how are we looking? How's, how's so your- Look at how charred up this is. That's how I like it right there. Okay. Those onions, those things are fried up. Hang on, I gotta hold it just to make sure you get a good shot. Yeah, that's right. Brown. Yeah, I like it. that's how I like it. Perfect. All right, so I turned my heat down a little bit because I wanted to make sure you caught up. Oh, we're good. I'm caught up. I'm, I'm heating up my water. I'm ready to put this rice on. All right, so we're gonna add the rice, the tomatoes, your rinsed black beans, your peppers, and then the taco seasoning. And we're gonna stir all this to combine. So I'm adding in my grain. Cody, why don't you add in your rice? Okay. So one of the other things when you're cooking grains is sometimes like people like to toast them. Gives them a little bit more flavor. So that's kind of what we're doing here. We're toasting them. So you add your grain. Um, we're gonna add in some tomato. So it's a one can of roasted tomato. Um, it's 14.5 ounce. Um, I had to buy a little bit bigger one, 20 ounces. So I'm just gonna put half of my roasted tomatoes in there. Oh yeah, all those tomatoes going in. Uh, also gonna add in the black beans. So you got your can of black beans. Add those in there. And then we're gonna add all of your cut up bell peppers. It's so satisfying when you put it all in there and it's just, you know? Good things are gonna happen. Makes me feel like I'm doing something good. You are. You're cooking at home. You're being mindful of what you're eating and, and how you're preparing your food. This is all good stuff. And then the last thing, if you get all that stirred up, I think now's a good time to get that all stirred up. Get some of the liquid from the tomatoes and with the chicken. Right there. Sure. And at this point, we're going to add in that taco seasoning. Now, here's the thing about the taco seasoning. You can make your own or you can buy the packet. I would say this is a level of convenience question. Do you like to just be able to open up a packet and pour it in? Or do you like to make your own taco seasoning that has its own spiciness to it? Maybe it has a little bit more pepper, maybe it has more cinnamon in it. Um, I like the idea of making my own just because there aren't some of the preservatives and some of the added ingredients that you'll find in some of the packets of, of taco seasoning. So like this one has evaporated cane syrup and citric acid that's in it, even though it's organic. Um, I'm not picking on this. This is a great convenience item, but I like to mix up my own. Okay, so Cody, I don't know if you've done it yet, but you're going to yeah. have two tablespoons of your taco seasoning. So I mix this up ahead of time. I'm just going to do my two tablespoons. All right, it's going in. Here it is. Boom, we're seasoning it up. Right. Now I have heard with this recipe, I think this is a good disclaimer. I have heard with this recipe, it is a little spicy. So if you're someone that doesn't like so much spice, maybe you can cut back a little bit on some of the, the chili powders and the red pepper flakes that went into that taco seasoning that's listed there. All right, so now that we got all that in there, we're gonna stir that to combine and we're gonna add in the broth. So the broth is one and a half cups. So Cody, I don't know if you have yours measured out already. Nope, I don't. I'm gonna do that so I don't blow this because this part's actually important. All right, one, one cooking rule. When you're measuring liquids, you should always use a liquid measuring cup. When you're measuring um, dry things, then you use your measuring spoons and your measuring cups. Okay. A lot of people use the liquid into the dry measuring cup. How much did you say you're throwing yeah. in there? One and a half cups here. Okay. And the only reason I make that recommendation is this, you can be a little bit more exact if you're measuring that way you know if you if you're cooking versus baking i guess it doesn't really matter that much all right i'm going to pour in my stock or my broth now it's important to make sure you get as much of those grains into the liquid 
so that it starts cooking those greens. Oh, it's looking good. Now I'm just gonna, I'm gonna set a timer just so that we have an eye on the time. We're gonna let this cook for 15 minutes. 15 minutes is about the amount of time that you would need to cook quinoa. But really all you're doing is you're waiting for the juices and the liquid to evaporate out and cook those grains. So you're gonna keep an eye on it like you would if you were boiling rice or boiling quinoa on its own. So occasionally we're gonna come back to this and we're just gonna stir it up, making sure that all those grains get down in there so we don't have any crunchy grains left over. Okay, sound good? Good, yeah, it looks real good. All right. All right. So I was, so we were gonna talk about what my favorite recipe is to make. Yes. Honestly, the simplest thing, I do this like three times a week, I like to do ground chicken lettuce wraps, and so I'll just like see whatever whatever we're feeling like when we when uh when we fry up the the ground the ground chicken. Season that, however, and then I like to put some hummus on those those big uh, romaine lettuce wraps. Put a little bit of the the ground turkey or the ground turkey or ground chicken, whatever it is, and then have like a bowl of fruits and vegetables with that. That is like my go-to because it's easy because you can I mean you can make a whole lot of ground chicken or turkey at one time. Put that in the fridge. And everything else is there. You don't have to cook anything. And so I might, I might eat like seven or eight or nine if I'm going crazy, you know, of those, those, uh, those wraps. And, and that's it, extremely basic, but I mean, it's, it's always good. And, um, you know, it's all healthy too. So. The hummus adds, acts like a little paste to keep the yes. meat. This Cody like that it kind of sticks to it. It's nice. Right. That's right. Um, but I did have a question for you, Cody. Okay. Smart question. What was the most challenging country that you went to to compete in, in terms of food and fueling? And then what were your go-to? Like, how did you figure it out? What, what meals or foods did you go to? Or what was your strategy in making it through that time? Yeah, so it was actually, I mean, we've been lucky enough to go all over the world and eat some pretty crazy food. But this past summer, um, I was on the Pan American Games team and we went to Lima, Peru. And crazy thing is like Lima, Peru is known for having like world-class culinary food. However, the dining hall situation was not the best. And um, it was the, the vegetables and a lot of the foods were, were washed with questionable water. So we were kind of advised to stay away from a lot of the food in that dining hall. And it was, it was rough. And we were there for like almost three weeks. I got to the, I got to the point where I was putting, I was putting uh, Tabasco sauce on everything like everything i was eating and to this day to this day when i taste tabasco i have like flashbacks of when i was in peru it was like it was crazy but i just started i got to the point where i was just sticking to things that i knew i could eat like i was we were getting a lot of those um lean chicken and beef sticks and i was eating i was eating a lot of those we had fortunately team usa had a lot of dried fruits available in the team room areas so like you know things like apples things that had skin um those things you know, we're often a lot more safer to eat, but that was probably like the hardest, the hardest experience. Oh, man. Like, this tastes like Lima. Yeah, it really does. Like when I taste Tabasco, I'm like, there it is. That was, that was, that's Peru. That's it. My goodness. Uh, how much, um, how much more time do you think we need, Cody? Yeah, I think mine's pretty much done. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Pretty good. I, I may have a couple more minutes, but um, we want to see you plate yours up. Yeah, I'm gonna plate it up, make it look super great. And so, yeah, that's the last part of this recipe. Is um, you know, you, you've made your your taco skillet, um, but then flavoring it up with some various things. Like I think I saw Cody you were cutting up an avocado. Um, he's the pro who said wait to cut that up until right before you're gonna eat it. It's gonna taste the best that way. Um, you cannot. This is a, a heart healthy fat uh, coming from the avocado. Um, another way you can increase the calorie content is use um, a whole Greek, plain Greek yogurt, which tastes a lot like sour cream. So instead of using sour cream that doesn't have the protein, you could add the, the protein of the Greek yogurt. Um, I don't know, Kevin, I think Cody, you're going to add that little tidbit. I was about to say, I'm gonna, that's what I'm going to do. I'm about to put some yogurt on this thing. Yes. And so um, the other way you can kind of manipulate this recipe, depending on how you're training. So let's just say you're the open water swimmer that's Cody's roommate. You make this 
and then you could have some cooked rice on the side that you are adding this onto that cooked rice as a topping. So it's kind of like, you know, you're just, you have your, your base of carbohydrate and then you're adding this on in addition to, yes, it already has some grain in it, but that's where you can kind of get more carbs in there. Um, let's just say you are, um, you're more of a sprinter and you don't need as many of the carbs, but maybe you need to focus on protein because you're doing a lot of lifting in the weight room and that kind of thing. Then you have a lot of protein for the recipe. You add in the Greek yogurt as more protein. Um, and, and that protein can also help too with uh, filling you up, making you feel fuller for longer. Um, so for some athletes that have really big appetites and they want to control how much they're eating, um, increase the protein. That's a, a good way to kind of fill up on something that's good, that's going to stay with you a little bit longer. Um, the other way, and we talked about this in the beginning, if you're someone that really likes vegetables, you know, don't just stick with what's on the paper in terms of only two bell peppers are allowed. You could cut up three of those. You could cut up the whole onion like Cody did. Um, and, you know, you can kind of be a little bit more vegetable heavy or add in an extra can of beans instead of the, the lean ground turkey that we use today. Okay, so those are some ways that you can kind of really play with the recipes. I always say, and I said it earlier, baking is kind of a chemistry experiment. You have to be really particular about the serving sizes of various ingredients that are in there. But when you're cooking, it's an art. It's really whatever flavors you want to have. Um, you know, you can choose a different type of oil you want to cook with. We used olive oil today. Um, some people like the taste of different types of oils, like coconut oil is something that people like the taste of that. Um, but, you know, you can really switch up things depending on the taste that you're looking for. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take that, uh, the Greek yogurt, and I'm going to mix it up with a little bit of lemon. I'm going to squeeze this lemon into a dish, kind of spin it up a little bit. That's what I'm going to drizzle on top. Love it. Mm -hmm. That's right. Cody's the art artist. I said it's cooking's an art. He's the artiste. <laughs> I might even put, I might even put a little bit of cheese on it just cause I don't know. It's just going to taste so good. I don't do a lot of cheese though. I really don't. I don't do a whole lot of cheese, but I mean, I feel like, I feel like it might be called for right now. The biggest thing with cheese is just paying attention to serving sizes. Yeah. It is, it's, it's a fat, right? And so if, you know, sometimes, um, one piece of cheese, especially like on those, um, like if you're at a, a party and there's just appetizers of cut up cheese and crackers, people go to town on the cheese, that's, it just adds up. Um, there's obviously some benefits to dairy. I mean, there's, there's, um, there's calcium, there's a bunch of different B vitamins and things added to it. But like I said, it does add up in calories. And, um, you know, sometimes that can just take the place of some of the other foods that are really good for you. So just be mindful of that. But I, I think on chili, it's great. Sprinkle some of that on there. Yeah. It's like bending over like emerald. <laughs> get my cheese out oh gosh yeah, he's going for it I, l I love watching athletes put together their meals because some of it's like they they have a way they have a method The other thing you could add to this that I, I thought about it um, talking about earlier, so we only added bell peppers to this. If you're someone that likes a little heat, likes a little kick, you can cut up um, a chili pepper or a jalapeno pepper in here. That's not something, we didn't do that today, but um, that's an add you can do later if you're making this recipe more than once. All right, so I put a little bit of shredded cheese on and now i'm gonna do some chili flakes too oh man your wife's okay. it's done you don't even know that's nothing she's a savage she just I mean, spicy foods are good for your heart that's what i hear okay here it is let's see up close oh that looks good oh man good Perfect execution. I passed an A plus. I set the by har. You did great, Cody. Thank you so much for this good stuff. Yes. And for sharing some of your experiences and uh, kind of what fuels you and gets you through the day. I will say honestly though, like 
like di- I know I said it earlier, but diet and eating healthy have helped me get so much better at swimming. I can't even put that into words. I mean, I'll never forget the days when I was a little kid and I would get those Sour Patch Kids or those Sour Straws and pound those before races. And uh, when I stopped doing that, like I started feeling better. <laughs> I started swimming better too. And one time, I always tell the story. I uh, I ate two bags of Skittles when I was really young. I was probably like 13 years old before a 400 IM. And I swam the race. And right when I finished the race, I got out of the pool. I took two steps and I just projectile vomited Skittles, like Skittly goodness, just into the air. Like it was bad. And from that moment on, I was like, okay, like from from 13, I was young. I was like, I, I can't eat this before before races anymore. I just so I learned that, like, learn from, learn from my mistakes because it sucks. Like, to this day, I don't, even, I don't like Skittles anymore. I can't eat them. So. You know, most athletes have that aha moment, good and bad. So, uh, Cody, yeah. we hope you enjoy your, your recipe. And um, that's the other side of this. Once you've made your food, sit down and enjoy it and be mindful of your creation. Just look at it again. Yep, there it is. Nailed it. Boom. Thank oh, wait, so we- much, Cody, and thank you, USA ah. so- for tuning in and um, hopefully you learned just a couple tricks tips and um, you learned from Cody thank you again buddy thanks